with over 85% of adults in the United States having at least one marker of metabolic syndrome. We are at a very uncomfortable time in our country's history. This applies to countries all over the world who've adopted a modern diet. The majority of adults are metabolically ill. The time for choosing our words softly and holding back and mincing words is over. It's time to talk with real words, words that might offend some people. And I'm interviewing the author of a new book, and this book is called The Unholy Trinity. So you can tell right off the bat, this guy's not going to mince words. Uh, I'm interviewing Daniel Trevor today, who is a serial entrepreneur and a citizen scientist, and I'm going to bring him up. Daniel, welcome. Hey, thanks, Dr. Ken. I really appreciate you having me. It's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, when I saw the title of your book, I was like, oh, this looks very interesting. I like the title already. Uh, and you're a, a man after my heart. You basically want to tell it like it is. And I think the time has come for that. And your book, Unholy Trinity, does that. And I wanted to interview you because your story is compelling, how you got to, to the point where you wrote a book with a title like this. And so Let's talk about this. Before we get started, I want you to tell everybody a little bit about yourself, how you came to this point where you're like, you know, I need to write a book about this. <laughs> well, here's the deal. Um, about four years ago, I had a heart attack and it was completely shocking to me because I was a lean, symptom-free Mr. Healthy or so I thought, right? And I had done a lot of tests that my doctors had recommended. I even got a stress test. I passed that with flying colors. <laughs> I still had the heart attack. And by the way, I cover all that in the in chapter 17, which is about the, there's a section called the wicked triangle, uh, which is the, uh, you know, the stress test, the cath lab with the stent, and, and then you're on medications and so on and so forth. Um, but anyway, I had that, and then I decided, having studied technical data throughout my life, I decided to take a dive into the medical and nutrition sides to find out, how could this happen to me? I'm Mr. Healthy, right? <laughs> and what I discovered really blew my mind and actually shocked and pissed me off, if I can use those kind of words. Um, you sure can. Because what we've been told to eat for decades is killing us. And that's why the subtitle of the book, Unholy Trinity, is how carbs, sugar, and oils make us fat, sick, and addicted, and how to escape their grip. Yep. How carbs, and you know, sugar, and oils make us fat, sick, and addicted, and how to escape their grip. I love it. Daniel, one thing I find is when, <clears throat> when we have somebody like you with a scientific mind, I mean, you're an entrepreneur, you're a citizen scientist, you, you're, you, you have a scientific mind invariably when somebody like you comes from an, another scientific discipline and, and typically it's after they've had a health scare, right? They've either had a heart attack or they had some health scare and they're like, I thought I was eating pretty healthy. I mean, I was following <laughs> this guideline or that guideline. Let me look into the nutrition science. And I always put that in air quotes because I don't know if it's fair to call nutrition science a science, but invariably when somebody like you comes from another scientific discipline and looks at the nutrition literature and says, okay, let me look into this, invariably they come to the same conclusion that I did, that you did, that multiple other people who talk about nutrition now who weren't classically trained in nutrition, they were classically trained in another scientific discipline. They come to nutrition, dig into it because they've had the scare. They invariably say, I think nutrition science is a load of crap. I think <laughs> three things you should avoid and get out of your diet immediately. And I think your the title of your book kind of t gives us a hint. And so tell us, what what is the unholy trinity that everybody who watches this immediately should eliminate from their diet? <laughs> Well, you know, it's amazing you point that out because, you know, I was just on uh, your colleague and friend, Dr. Philip Ovedia, 
cardiologists and uh, heart surgeons done over what, 3,000 heart operations. He asked me a similar uh, type of question. He said, and it was, it was a very revealing question and very validating to me too. It was something like, um, how is it that you as a non-physician were able to figure all this out and 99% of medical doctors can't or won't? <laughs> and so we explored that in that, but you know, you're right on there because, uh, you know, there's so many reasons for that, but the unholy Trinity again is the carbs, the sugar and the oils. And, um, it's ba when I say the carbs, I'm talking about your refined and industrial processed grains, which they then turn into bread, pasta, cereal, crackers, biscuits, waffles, pancakes, chips, pretzels, rolls, pizza, tortillas, and on and on. And then the other form of carbohydrates, which is candy cake, ice cream, soda, fruit juice, uh, and pastries, and on and on that way. So it, those are the carbs, right? And then the sugar, we know what, what, you know, nothing has been covered about that to know why we need to avoid that. And Robert Lustig did a beautiful job on that years ago with that video. I think it's got like, what, 25 million views, the yeah. bitter truth about the sugar. And, um, and so, and then we have the oils. Oh my God, I had no idea that these oils, oils were poisonous, that they weren't, they weren't even the, in the human diet prior to about a hundred years ago. Yep. Uh, they were used as uh, machinery lubricant in the industrial revolution. I mean, it's like, and then they, they looked at a bucket and said, hey, it looks like lard. Why don't we feed it to people? We can make money that way. Yeah. And Many people you know, do that. They have no idea that human beings have only been consuming canola oil for about 50 years. They're just like, and I had no idea. I, they, first of all, it never occurs to people to think about that. Secondly, when you tell them that, they don't know what to do with that information uh, because so many people, as you know, they trust, trust the science, right? And then they're like, well, they wouldn't have it on the market if it was bad for you. And I agree that they're not going to put something on the market that's going to kill you quickly because if they do, attorneys get involved, right? If you, if you, if you build a car that just kills people left and right, yeah, you're going to be sued out of business. But what if you, you create a car, and this has happened several times in the automotive industry, that has a weird little design flaw that only causes a problem one-tenth of one percent of the time. But when you're making millions of cars, that's going to be way more dead people than you'd like for there to be. And we've seen that in the automotive industry in the past. That things That's happened with turn signals and other things. But it's it, nobody's going to put a food on the market that kills you in a matter of minutes, hours, days, or weeks. That'd be stupid. The attorneys are not going to let them do that. But they will put things on the market that's going to slowly kill you over decades, two decades, three decades, four decades. They don't care. Nobody's going to sue them for that. So they're at liberty to do that. And so basically sugar, grains, uh, and vegetable seed oils. And with those three ingredients, you can make anything from a tortilla to a jelly donut with those three ingredients, a pizza crust. And people think these are different products. What they don't understand is it's the same exact product, just different ratios of those same three ingredients. And the reason they choose those ingredients is because they're so cheap and they're so shelf stable and they don't kill you quickly. Now I'm a carnivore. I don't know. I'm, we're going to get into your diet in a minute, but I don't think the vast majority of people if they've just been eating the standard Western diet, they don't have to be a carnivore. If they just eliminate the, the grains, the carbohydrates, the sugars, and the vegetable seed oils, they're going to reverse the vast majority of their metabolic disease. Do you agree, Daniel? Absolutely. Just do that alone. And I, I you know, my book is kind of a how-to book because uh, even though it has more scientific citations than any other book out there. I mean, most of them have two or 300. I have 1,227. And so, and early in the book, I say, look, I know you're probably thinking without formal university medical uh, degrees and organic chemistry and so forth, why the hell should I trust you? And I tell them, don't, none of this is my opinion. This is, just think of me as a friendly relay point of what the best of 21st century science has to offer for your health and wellness and get better and fix yourself. I did. You can too. 
these this is what the latest correct science rcts uh, randomized control trials meta analyses all the good ones i made sure i didn't pay attention to anything that had funding from big food big pharma or big medicine because as you know big food alone has in their corporate offices around the world they have biochemical geniuses phd's in their conference rooms figuring out okay so what is it that we can add to these ingredients that makes them eat more of it it's more for the bottom line and profit as opposed to what's good for human beings because <laughs> all of this stuff was never in the human diet prior to a hundred years ago. And yep. so and you're a businessman, Daniel, you've, you've created multiple businesses, had many, many employees. You understand the business world. What is big food? And so a lot of people, it's so unhealthy. It's so bad when you look into it that people become conspiratorially minded like this. There must they must be trying to kill us. I don't think that's the case, but I want you to speak to us as a businessman. What is big food thinking? Does big food know that the majority of their processed foods are slow poisons did, did, have they literally crunched the numbers with attorneys and, and accountants and bean counters and said, yeah, the lawsuits are going to be minimal. It's it's we're going to make a billion dollars. What what happens in the boardrooms of these big food manufacturers? How are they able to sleep at night? Well, here's the thing. There's an example of one of those things you're talking about. Uh I think it's in chapter seven. I'm not sure. I, anyway, Goldman Sachs, the international banker. They had one of their analysts do a white paper and it was, I can't remember the name of it, but it was about, and it was for their biotech pharma companies. And they're looking at, well, creating cures is not good for the bottom line. Yep. This is just one aspect of it, right? They said, you know, while it may be good for society, it's not good for the bottom line, the, the, the money. And the yep. example that they gave was this drug, uh, the big pharma company, Gilead Sciences. And they yep. had this blockbuster drug called Harvoni. Yep. And it had a 96 to 99% thing. cure rate. Yep. And when it was, was first out, it was like, what, $12 billion or something? And then within a couple of few years, it was down 75%. And it continued its descent after that. So although cures may be good for society, hey, it's not good for the shareholders. So knock it off. So I'm sure some of that mentality goes for some of the big food companies that have shareholders and they have people at the top that are, you know, they may not eat their product, <laughs> but they're going to continue to sell it because it's flying off the shelves. And if people don't understand that, there's no education about any of this information. And that's why I've written the book. Like yours, you know, you have, I have yours here. It's just fantastic. Lies my doctor told me, and you've written it for the average reader of health and wellness. I did the same thing. I said, I need to write this in a way for like Uncle Joe or my brother Dave, who's not technically oriented and um, that kind of thing. And so I try to communicate to the, I may, I'll mention the study, this study, it was this many people over this many years, and this is what the results show. So stop eating that thing. <laughs> right. Yep. And let me go over this because this is absolutely true. I have read this report from Goldman Sachs. So Gilead Pharmacy, they created a cure for hepatitis C. And so if any of you guys know somebody with hepatitis C, there are still people out there that don't know there's a cure for that. that that's 97% effective. Okay. And it's a, it's a regimen of uh, medication that cures it 97% of the time. And Goldman Sachs, and I'm sure Gilead had borrowed money from Goldman Sachs to come up with this thing. And Goldman Sachs wrote a white paper and said, basically, you shouldn't have done this. What you should have come up with <laughs> was a treatment for hepatitis C that you could take a pill once a day. There you go. An injection once a week or an infusion once a month. That, that would be a much better profit model. But the because you're going to make a ton of money right up front, everybody who has hepatitis C, they're going to be saving up their nickels trying to be able to, you know, save up and get this cure. But what about after you've cured everybody of hepatitis C? Your model falls apart. We don't like that model. And so <laughs> this is absolutely a true story. Gilead cured hepatitis C and Goldman Sachs investment banker yelled at them and said, Dad, don't do that anymore. We don't like that. That's not a good business model. Uh, absolutely a true story. So you think the big food manufacturers, they'd much rather 
keep selling the crap that's a slow poison and banking that 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 daily income, weekly income, monthly income for decades to come because they're not killing anybody quickly. People love it. It tastes delicious. People, you know, they they jump on Twitter and say, oh, look at my bowl of Fruit Loops and chocolate milk. It's so <laughs> delicious because the average person doesn't yeah. know better. And what kind of diet were you following before your heart attack? How what was your body size? I mean, were you healthy and active or were you well, just sitting around on the couch eating Cheetos? No, 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 not the Cheetos. I knew enough to stay to not indulge in that, but I was a, I had a high carb diet. I was totally sold on the propaganda, the BS of heart healthy, air quotes coming at you for those yep. listening, heart healthy whole grains. Yeah. And so in the morning I'd have this granola that had to have at least 50 or 60 grams of, <laughs> of carbohydrates in that, probably with some HFCS, uh, high fructose corn syrup. And so you know, I was a high carb and I avoided, I tried to avoid a little bit the sugar. I mean, I had the occasional, um, uh, you know, dessert or that kind of thing. But I didn't know that these carbohydrates made from the grains, they turn into sugar in your body. Yep. And I didn't know any of that. And I didn't know. And, and I should have paid attention. I should have done some testing. And that's why I urge in the book, you have to do uh, one of your colleagues and friends, Dr. Ford Brewer, who's, you know, Spent, spent decades teaching Smart and guy. training other doctors. Um, he, I asked him to write chapter 22, and that turns out to be what are the most important blood labs and scans that anyone can get that your doctor will go, oh, you don't need that. You don't need that. You're fine. And the only reason they tell you don't you don't want it is because they wouldn't know how to interpret it anyway, right? Yep. So I show how to you, you can get those tests, what they are, and how you can buy them inexpensively online without needing a doctor's prescription. That way you yourself can find that if you've got something lurking inside that uh, coincides with your genetics that mom and dad had and your Uncle Joe, uh, or you're just fine or somewhere in between that, hey, I need a, a attach i need to check out my why my ggt is elevated uh gamma glutamyl transferase that's a liver enzyme which is very important i like to come back to but you were so right in the beginning you said over 85 percent. what is it the study from 2019 showed that only 12 percent of the population and this was like a what a seven-year study is yep. metabolically healthy and that means the other 88 percent are not and like they say in the infomercials but wait there's more <laughs> A more recent study in 2022 showed, and this is out of JAC, a Journal of the American College of Cardiology, the top place on the planet for cardiology and so forth. And they did a, va a big test. It was like over 55,000 people. And they found that, what was it? 6.8% of the population is metabolically healthy. Yep. That means 93.2% of the population is metabolically healthy, healthy, and they don't know it because there's no signs, there's no symptoms. I mean, check out this stat. I mean, talk about me being lucky. Most of the people who have, who have a deadly first heart attack, their very first symptom of heart disease is their own death. I mean, it's crazy. Yep. And, uh, you know, why doctors don't understand this or why they, well, we can go into all that on in a, a little later if you want to, but, um, you know, you have to find out what are the tests that you must have, because I believe that if you go through life, especially after you're 40 and you are not testing, it's like driving in the, down the road without a speedometer or a steering wheel, you will crash into something and you go, wow, how did this happen to me? You know, I know my uncle Joe has it, but I didn't know I was going to get it. So you have to test and like Dr. Ford Brewer calls his chapter 22, don't guess, test. Yep. And I yeah. agree, especially when you're getting started, you need to test and you need to know. But to stick just for another minute to the food, I was yeah. watching, I, I'm on all social media because I'm trying to reach people who don't know this information. That's that's my job. That's my calling. Yes. And I was on TikTok and this young mom was making breakfast for her little girl. And it was she was literally taking... Uh, powdered donuts out of the bag and cutting them up into small bite-sized pieces for her daughter, whom she loves. 
So the, the, the biggest problem is the average person has no idea that what you eat actually matters. I mean, if you ask them, they'd be like, well, I'm sure it's probably, there's probably a better breakfast, but this is fine or they wouldn't be for sale, right? And so everybody watching this, all 1,600 of you guys, I need you to hit the thumbs up or the heart right now. <laughs> the reason being is that sends that, that tells the social media this is valuable. And it's going to share it with more people. Maybe even that young mom who was feeding her sweet little daughter, whom she loves very much, powdered donuts for breakfast. She doesn't know how big of a deal that is. She probably thinks, yeah, it's not perfect, but it's not that big a deal. It's a huge deal. She's setting her daughter up for metabolic disease, and she doesn't know better right now. The only way she's going to know better is if you click the share button and share this on your favorite social media. That's how you reach new people. And then those new people are going to reach new people. And it's going to keep snowballing until finally that young mother, somebody's going to say, honey, that is terrible for your daughter. Please stop. Don't do that. There are much better options. OK, you got to you got to share this message. That's how it's going to get out. You got to share Daniel Trevor's book, The Unholy Trinity. That's how this is going to get out to the <laughs> mainstream people who just they just don't know better. But then there's the second group of people like Daniel. He knew diet mattered. He knew it mattered. And so he had been tricked. He had made what I call the false choice. He, he was definitely not going to drink Pepsi and eat powdered donuts for breakfast. He knew better than that. He was going to eat a whole grain Danish and he was going to have a fruit smoothie, right? Or a glass of fruit juice because that's healthy. This is the false choice. So many people make this false choice and they switch to whole grain bread and whole grain Danish and whole grain everything and eat lots of fruits and vegetables. That's how they always put it, right? And they'll have a fruit juice smoothie every morning because that's healthy. Well, for the vast majority of people, that's no more healthy. They might as well just have the damn Pepsi and powdered donuts because it's, <laughs> it's literally 10% less bad to have the whole grain Danish and the fruit juice smoothie. There is a choice, but that's the false choice. And that's why so many people have given up on their diet is because they're like, I tried all that whole grain bullshit. None of that, it didn't help me a bit because it's a false choice. Either way, the big food manufacturers, if you're eating Lucky Charms for breakfast, they get your money. If you're eating the whole grain Danish and the fruit smoothie, they still get your money. There's only one choice that is not a false choice, and that's a proper human diet. And that's what Daniel finally discovered. It took him a heart attack to do it. But he finally discovered it. Now, let's talk about testing. I've got a book called Common Sense Labs that, that talks about most of the books that uh, that uh, the cardi your cardiologist friend who wrote a chapter in your book, I'm a big fan of his. He's a smart guy, uh, Ford Brewer. Yeah. Uh, very intelligent. But he says, if you're not testing, then you're, you're in the dark. You don't know what's going on. Let's talk about some testing. If people are like, well, my doctor says every time I go to the doc, I checked all your labs and everything's normal. What does your doctor mean by that? What they mean typically is I checked a complete blood count. I checked a basic metabolic panel. I checked a lipid panel and I checked the urine. All your labs are normal. First of all, that is, that is wholly inadequate to check your metabolic health. That's not nearly what you need, especially if you're over the age of 40. You need way more testing than that. Let's talk about testing, Daniel Trevor. Sure. Yeah. Well, um, as you probably know, there was a study out of Johns Hopkins just as recent as 2019. And 2019 in the medical field is like, what, 10 minutes ago, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because it takes so long for the information to get not only to the front lines of the doctors, but how long it takes to get into the medical curriculum of the schools uh, that are funded by Big Pharma, by the way. And right. so <laughs> I don't want to get into all that. But anyway, this study showed that 74% of doctors, and we're talking cardiologists, general practitioners, and internists, 74% do not know how to properly test for prediabetes or diabetes, let alone know how to deal with it or treat it. Yep. 74%. And, and Dr. Ford and I were commenting on a podcast I did with him a little while back. That, you know, no wonder it's an epidemic. It's a silent epidemic that most people don't know. I mean, that was me. I had, I was a raging type two diabetic and I didn't know it just like Peter Atia. He got his from drinking so much Gatorade and he's an, was an incredible athlete, you know, triathlon and all that. And I, 
you know, I thought I was fine because most doctors, what they do is they'll test fasting blood glucose and A1C. And even the American Diabetes Association will tell you, hey, you're going to miss 70, 80 percent of the people if you're just going to do that. They don't test the most important one, which I have. It's chapter seven, and I called it the most important health test you've never had, which is the test that detects if you are where you are in the diabetic, diabetic spectrum, because the, detecting that is so important because, as you know, the, si the silent diseases all come from having some degree of a diabetic physiology, your heart attacks, strokes, uh, amputations due to diabetic uh, neuropathy, your sleep apnea, your certain cancers, um, you know, on and on. And so PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome and so on, which I have a whole chapter on that as well. Um, anyway, so they don't know this test and the test is the OGTT with insulin, oral glucose tolerance test with insulin. And doctors don't order it because patients don't like to do it because it takes two hours. Yeah, but if you're going to find out, you got to spend the two hours and do it. And I describe it all in the book, what it is, how it works. And that's what I did. I did, I, af, soon after my um, heart attack, I decided, I found out about all these different tests and I felt I got to get a, a lot of testing done so I could have a benchmark that I could measure my progress, you know, three months, six months and so forth down the line. So this was one of the ones that I got. And I, to my chagrin, found out that, you know, because I wanted to find out the good, the bad, and the ugly. I knew I was going to have a bad report card, but I had no idea. I, I was like most people. Well, I might be pre-diabetic, but there's no way I'm type 2 diabetic. I right. was, mine was well over 200 on now, the second hour. Or and the for first those of you guys day. watching who don't know a lot about labs, you can, somebody like Daniel can be a severe, uncontrolled type 2 diabetic. And if all you check is a fasting blood sugar, which is part of the basic metabolic panel, it can be normal. If he, if Daniel fasted overnight, you can have a normal blood sugar and be a severely uncontrolled type two diabetic. Now the oral glucose tolerance test with insulin is an excellent test, but it takes two hours. And so if we have any young healthcare providers watching this, you can get almost exactly the same quality of information by checking a fasting blood sugar and A1C and a fasting insulin all at the same time. That's going to give you almost all the information, and you, it doesn't take two hours to do that. You can literally do it and be done in five minutes. But the average doctor, they have no idea. They think if the fasting blood sugar is normal, well, you're fine. I'll see you in a year. Absolutely untrue. You've got to check an A1C and a fasting insulin or an OGGT with insulin. That's the only way you're going to uncover potentially hidden diabetes. Yeah, you're exactly right. And another one that I mentioned earlier, the GGT, the gamma glutamyl transferase, they usually leave that off too. That's a um, that's a liver enzyme. Most doctors just check the ALT, ASP, ALT. Well, most doctors don't even check that. They check a basic <laughs> metabolic panel, seriously. And yeah. that doesn't check any liver function whatsoever. Now, if you check a complete metabolic panel, then that's going to have an ALT and an AST. But a doctor is going to have to order the GGT separately. And most docs either are too lazy or they just don't know the power of getting that GGT. It's a very, very important test. What have you learned about that test? Well, <laughs> well, I learned that's how I discovered I had um, fatty liver disease. I had NAFLD, N -A -F -L -D, non alcoholic fatty liver disease. Cause I don't drink no drugs. I'm You're not already... a big drinker, but you still had fatty liver. Yeah, that was from all the HFC, uh, high fructose corn syrup that I was getting in my diet that I didn't realize was on everything in my pantry. I'm looking at the labels. I'm going, it's there, it's there, it's there, it's everywhere. And so that uh, every cell in the body can metabolize high fructose corn syrup, uh, or they can't rather, and the liver is the only one and it stores up fatty. And so I had discovered this when I, uh, you know, early on, I went to YouTube university and Google university and I found all the, and besides all the studies that I had looked at and books and so forth. And I discovered this guy, well, you know, one of your friends and colleagues, Ivor Cummins. And he had what I had. He had this thing called elevated GGT. So I'm going, yeah. what's that? So I had to take the deep dive in that. And that's why I, my chapter 15 covers fatty liver disease and kidney disease. And in that I, 
I just, well, I discovered that I had this <laughs> elevated GGT and it was because, uh, well, first of all, the level is supposed to be 65 IU or under. Mine was 265. Oh, holy guacamole, that's Batman, that's right? That. So I was wet. And so I had a, you know, but again, my type two diabetes was the source of my cardiovascular disease and my non-alcoholic fatty, fatty liver disease. And it turns out to be my osteoporosis as well. And doing all this research and what I have in this how-to book that I wrote, I was able to reverse all four of those things. So the GGT, the reason why it's so important and the medical field seems to be blind to it. Here's the deal. Life insurance companies, they got to know it's just money to them, right? It's just, they got to know who do they reject who do they accept? And their number one predictor of all cause mortality is elevated GGT, gamma glutamyl transferase. Why don't the doctors know what the life insurance? And again, they're just crunching numbers. These life insurance actuaries, they're just crunching numbers. They just want to, they're just interested in the bottom line. They want to know who to reject, who to accept. And if you got elevated GGT, I'm telling you, that's, you know, and then the studies I found show the elevated GGT is so closely related to cardiovascular disease. You know, I re then I realized, I said, wow, this is why I had that. It was just amazing. And so using all of these, getting all the studies, the right studies and following, finding people like you, Dr. Ford Brewer and other geniuses on the cutting edge of modern medical science and metabolic health and the proper human diet is I was able to go from a heart attack to six pack to stable plaque. Well, I don't know if it's in that order, but heart attack, stable plaque, six pack, I don't know, but which is very, and I the six pack part was not even a goal or something I worked strenuously on to achieve. And when I say six pack, I'm not talking about professional bodybuilders, six pack. I'm talking about the abdominal muscles that exist on any human that are covered by adipose tissue, uh, belly fat. Yep. You dissolve that, and there they are, right? All you guys and got a six-pack. All you guys, all 1,800 of you have a six-pack. You just currently maybe can't see it, but it's there, I promise you. And if you follow a proper human diet strictly enough or long enough, you're going to start to be able to see at least four of that six-pack. It's going to happen regardless of your age or your current condition. You just got to be strict enough for long enough. And so, Daniel Trevor, you talk about so many things in this book, and it's it's one of the most uh, cited. I mean, you literally, what do you have? Twelve hundred citations. Twelve hundred and twenty-seven. Yeah, so that's medical, why I say none of it's my opinion. <laughs> there are medical textbooks that don't have that many citations. I love that you went that extra mile and did that because that's a pain in the butt to do when you write a book is to have a a, work, a list of works cited. Uh, so many people now have been tricked. There's so many tricks out there because you know what? Big corporations will trick you to get your money. Did you know this is this? We know this to be a fact. OK, now they're saying, yes, but Daniel Trevor, we need to be eating a diet that is planet friendly. We need to take care of Mother Earth and we need to eat all the grains and all the, the peas and beans and <laughs> all of the, 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 the plant foods because that's the best diet for the planet what do you what do you think about planetary health versus diet or is that something we should consider is that is that a just a, a flat out trick what's going on there oh my god well gee i don't i gotta watch what i say here because i don't want the uh the overlords of the world economic forum and the who to come down on and youtube since they follow the who to come down on your channel. So I'll be careful in what I say here. Please. In chapter 12, I have this chapter called Eat the Right Meat and Help the Planet. And in it, I go into a lot of different things, the whole climate BS, the, you know, scientific consensus that they, oh, you got to find their scientific consensus. And I debunk that because i mean even in well it was 1633 galileo our brilliant physicist astronomer when he discovered that the earth was not the center of the universe and it revolved around the sun and the sun is in a system that's going around these other he he was imprisoned for life yep. because it was scientific consensus 
<laughs> that said and, that Earth was the center of the universe. And if, if there had been YouTube back then, he would have been banned from YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Been. Exactly. And, you know, let's not forget that the Earth is flat. That was scientific consensus consensus right. for a very long time too. So I give a lot of these examples, and let's and so the next time you hear uh, someone talking about scientific consensus, whether it's coming from government or the media, just know that what you're about to hear is as truthful as the COV ID jab is just as um, uh, is as safe and effective for everyone. And it stops transmission. And we know what a big bunch of bullshit that was, right? And so on and on. It's just, you know, and then I ask, why is it that the most rich and powerful elite of the planet are pushing plant-based diets when throughout recorded history, those were reserved for slaves, prisoners, and foot soldiers? Exactly. The Vikings, the Romans, they all marched on barley. The elites had all the meat they want. And so why is it they want us to eat grasshoppers and not eat the meat? Well, they do say that in a tweet from there, and I even have this in the book, they say, well, meat will be available, but we'll, it, it'll be a, um, an, uh, a very rarely done snack. Well, yep. thank you very much, Klaus. Uh, right. That's a nice slave master, you know? So I go into all that and I know that sounds a little political and all that, but Look, I, but I, think, I, gotta, I love that you use the term slave food because that's exactly what grains and beans are. They're slave food. And this is yeah. if you study any archaeology or anthropology, you know that S. Diamond's got a question. He needs some advice. He's he is going to eat a proper human diet. He said, but what do I do with all the food in my pantry now? Do I throw it away or do I donate it? Uh, so beans and rice, all the things made of, of sugar and grains and vegetable seed oils. That's slave food. That's prisoner food. <laughs> But it's also a great anti-starvation food. So I would donate it to the food yeah. bank. If people are truly hungry, yeah. those foods will keep you from starving to death. But if what yeah. you're looking for is to optimize your health, like Daniel Trevor's done, those foods play no part. And so I would donate all that junk to a food bank. It'll help keep people from starving to death. And then you eat the optimal food on a proper human diet to improve your health. Do you agree, Daniel? Oh yes, absolutely. And by the way, I um, I was telling Doctor Ovedio on his podcast a couple of weeks ago that I was I stole your um, what do you call it, ketovore. I had never heard that before. I knew carnivore and I knew what keto was, and I was at keto. I thought, well, I that's what that's me. I, I'm stealing Ken Berry's uh, Doctor Ken Berry's saying I'm more ketovore because I do have an occasional asparagus, which yep. is very low lectins and low carbohydrates and. You know, so try not to hold it against me, but what you're doing and what you're professing and what your um, your listeners and your viewers should understand, it's a very ancestral diet. And I, you know, you just do three things that I talk about that our ancient ancestors did, and you're going to get the six pack and you're going to get drop the weight and all that. And um, because w these evolutionarily developed meat bodies are used to eating a high fat, low carb diet. I mean, we've been eating meat for what? The entire time. Anywhere. Yeah. Anywhere from 2.6 confirmed by anthropologists and archaeo bioarchaeologists to 4.5, somewhere in there. Um, and then we didn't even start eating grains until about nine or 10,000 years ago. And that's right. like a snap of the finger in the eons of time. Right. And Human these bodies and all of our ancestors have been eating meat for exactly the same length of time that we have been breathing air, drinking water, and playing in the sunshine. All of those things have been a part of human existence from the beginning. And as Daniel said, we've only been eating grains in any meaningful amount for the last seven or 8,000 years. We've only been eating vegetable oils for 100 years. We've only been eating canola oil for 50 years. And so a lot of people would say, Daniel, well, that's just an appeal to nature. It doesn't matter what we did back then. But there's this concept in biology called the adaptation hypothesis. Yes. That when a, that's right. When a, when a species of, of animal has been doing something for a long damn time, They've adapted to it, and it, that's actually their healthy thing to do. So it would be the same thing as saying, well, Dr. Barry, you've got 70 sheep in the pasture, but we've done this new scientific study, and we've determined that 
the sheep should not eat grass. The sheep should eat this special food that we blended up in the in the factory. Everybody with any common sense is going to go, what? That don't make no sense. That's exactly <laughs> right, because it violates this adaptation hypothesis. Sheep have been eating grass since they've been on this planet. That is the, the diet that they should eat. Grass and weeds, grass and weeds, not this special chemical diet that Purina just came up with and got a patent on to get your money. That's not a proper sheep diet. That's bullshit. And the same thing goes for humans as well. We've been eating meat since we've been on planet Earth. You, and now all of a sudden meat's magically bad for us, Daniel Trevor. Well, absolutely. You know, it's just, uh, I agree with all of that. And I have a chapter 10 is called, are you a wheat addict? And the reason for that is because, well, you know, when we first started eating meat or um, wheat nine or 10,000 years ago, uh, everything changed. I have a picture. I have, I have a lot of images and graphs and charts and stuff. I want to make it easy for the list, for the reader to understand more. They can understand what a chart's going, looking like this on the obesity rate and so forth. And if it's doing this on something else. And so, um, I had this picture of a guy who, well, guy, it's his skull. He's 100,000 years old, or the skull is, and he's got perfect teeth, just absolutely perfect. And I asked, well, do you think he had an orthodontist, some dental floss, electric brush? He brushed three times a day and floss <laughs> twice a day. Yeah, no, he yeah, didn't do No, anything. no, no. And then after they've exhumed bodies after nine or 10,000 years ago, they could see perfect, uh, no, uh, instead of perfect teeth, all these new new diseases were coming in, not like the last hundred years or so, but all these new diseases and tooth decay, men shrunk five inches, women shrunk three inches. I mean, it was just a disaster. And, you know, they used grains and wheat and so forth as the anthropologists say, they used it as fallback food. When animals were not available, because our diet consisted of what we could catch, kill, and eat, nose and tail, right? And with it, when they were not available, they would ha grow the grains and uh, have the eat. Clever humans found out that if they boiled or they uh, ground up the seeds of these plants and they heated them, they created something like a porridge and, and allowed them to, an extra, to add an extra to survive an extra day, week, month. But they took a serious toll on their on their health and wellness and so forth. And then in the 50s and 60s, no, it was more like the 60s and 70s, big ag came along and they changed it all. Before that, it was, you know, shoulder length height that it grew to, you know, amber waves of grain and all that. And now it's only 18 inches. It's called semi-dwarf wheat, even though it's smaller, the seeds are bigger, and that's how they get a more bountiful crop from that. <clears throat> and so what they did was they, uh, they, they had this thing called chemical mutagenesis and radiation mutagenesis. And what that does is it amps up this chemical called gliadin, G-L-I-A-D-I-N, gliadin. And what does that do? It attaches to the opiate receptors of the brain. It doesn't get you high or, uh, you know, uh, relieve pain like what you're used to hearing. What it does is it makes you crave more of the things that have grains in them, like the bread, pasta, cereal, crackers, and so on, and pizza crust and so on. And you got to be careful when you buy the pizza crust at the supermarket that has is made out of cauliflower. Because what they've done is... There's only four wheat raises, as you know, the blood glucose levels higher than table sugar, higher than a Snickers bar. Even yep. I even have that in there, too. And when you eat those, it just raises it sky high. But there are four things that if they remove the, the wheat and grains, but they add in these other things, the other four things, I think it's what is it? Corn starch, rice starch, or no rice flour, potato flour, corn starch and potato starch. And so I think that's the four. Yeah. And what those do, those ra those are the only four things that raise your blood sugar higher <laughs> than wheat. And they put those in the pizzas that have cauliflower. Yeah. So, so, so in the, the package, it says cauliflower crust. But if you, <laughs> everybody who watches this channel should already know. But if you don't, listen. 
flip the package of anything you buy over, read the ingredients. Because the first ingredient for many of these cauliflower crust pizzas is potato flour or wheat flour, literally, or tapioca starch. There's going to be tapioca starch. That's the one I left out, the tapioca starch. He's right. Deadly, deadly. And so anyway, these um, it it makes us addicted to these foods. And that's why, check out this stat. Over uh, the average supermarket has sixty thousand products. Over fifty nine thousand of them have wheat or some form of wheat in them. Even yep. Twizzlers, the candy, the second ingredient is wheat. Yep. <laughs> I mean, they're really going after our opiate receptors, and um, you know, carbohydrates do not satisfy appetite; they stimulate it. Absolutely, and that's everybody knows. After you've been to the Chinese buffet, you're hungry two hours later, even though you ate like a pig. That's because you ate predominantly carbohydrates. And then two hours later, your blood sugar is dropping and you need a fix. You need another carbohydrate fix. This is this is well known. Uh, but many people don't realize that that's a problem that's going to lead to metabolic disease that that's going to lead to a heart attack. And that's what happened to Daniel Trevor. That's what he was. That was his wake up call. But he and I would like very much for you not to wait till you have a damn heart attack. We would very much like you to go, crap, these guys are serious. I'm going to read his book and then we'll read his book. And then I'm going to stop this now before I have a heart attack. That would be an amazing victory for you. Yes. And, and that's why Daniel and I are both doing what we do is we don't want you to have to go to the point where you have a heart attack and you wind up on the cath table going, crap, I thought what I was doing was pretty healthy. Yes, I'm telling you. Yeah, the the cath lab, you want to stay away from that because, you know, after you uh, do a stress test, uh, the doctor will say, well, you know, I'd like to take a closer look. And that means he wants to take you into the cath lab for a PCI, a percutaneous uh, coronary uh, intervention, right? Yep. Which means a, uh, it's going you're going to wind up with a stent because before you go in there, you have to sign a form that gives him carte blanche p- permission to, if he gets in there, hey, I'm going to add a stat, uh, um, a stent. And I cover this all in chapter 17, 18, and 19. I cover the statins. I got the whole thing in there for anybody interested in that whole area. But anyway, so, and the reason why stress tests, I mean, Dr. Ford Brewer even write, wrote a book called Prevention Myths. Uh, what is it? Why stress tests can't predict your heart attack and which tests do, right? Because, you know, lots of people, they pass their stress test with flying colors. That was, what was his name uh, on the, the, the newscaster guy, Tim Russert. He had this show. He was very popular. He had this TV show on Sunday mornings called meet the press. And he had just recently passed his stress test with flying colors and he died of a heart attack. Heart attack. It was the day before he was in the studio, and he just passed out and died of a heart attack. Let's not forget uh, comedian and um, actor. What's his name? Um, Gary Shandling. I love that guy. And he was only sixty six. Heart attack. And he had just passed his uh, uh, his uh, stress test with flying colors. Same thing with Davy Jones. He was also only sixty six. You know, he was the lead singer with that old group, the monkeys from the sixties and seventies. Right. And so many, Alex Trebek, the guy that was had the game show and um, he passed his stress test later had a heart attack. He survived it, but was taken a year or two later by pancreatic cancer, sadly. And so, um, you know, the reason for that is, and I have this in the book too, the reason why you don't, need to sign up for the stress test is because the stress test in order to to detect if there's any kind of potential problem you have to have at least 50 percent blockage in the arteries at least 50 percent however over 70 percent of all the heart attacks that occur occur with less than 50 (laughs) percent so what are we doing here this is not the you know you know i could that was me i passed my stress test and i had the heart attack so you can't depend on your doctor knowing what tests to do and 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 that kind of thing. So you got to rely on Dr. Uh, Ken Berry and his book, 
Uh, my book, my whole book, uh, I have that in several places, uh, mainly in chapter 22 that was written by Dr. Ford Brewer. And you got to remember, he's taught thousands of doctors and trained doctors, so he knows what they don't know. And, um, you know, you can you have access to all this information. So, look, I, you know, you don't get rich writing health books, but I have become very wealthy when I'm hearing back from, because the book's only been out six weeks or so, but hearing back from all these people around the world, all over the world, and they're going, wow, this, this has really changed my life. Thank you very much. And I'm going, oh man, that was, that was the reason why I wrote it. So I, my basic message is don't be like me, find out what's going on inside you with the proper testing. Absolutely. Daniel Trevor, his book is called The Unholy Trinity. There's a link to the book down in the show notes. I have to ask you, Daniel, uh, coming from somebody with ADHD, is there an audible version coming soon? Please say yes. Yes, I have to do that because I'm in talks right now with a guy. I'm saying, well, what do we do about all the charts and graphs? And says, well, we get a, well, there's a way to get around that. Yes. So I will be doing that. They will be coming at you. And I'll have all that for everybody. And also um, go to DanielTrevor.com. You can watch. I have a seven minute video that tells my story and gives some alarming statistics that uh, you have heard in this past uh, bit with with you. Uh, along with they can sign up for uh, a free preview of the book. And what that is, is the first 48 pages of the wow. of the book. And they can get that, get on the mailing list. And, uh, you know, I send out a weekly or biweekly newsletter and they can stay in touch with what's going on. And, um, you know, DanielTrevor.com. And then underneath that video, you'll see all these amazing endorsements from my people, all of your colleagues, you know, Nina Teicholz, Dr. Mark Hyman. I even have... um, Dr. Lou Ignaro, who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine oh, yeah. for his discovery of nitric oxide, you know, and on and on. So I've got, to, I really got lucky with that. I, you know, really scored some big names there, and I'm happy about that and very flattered. So thank you so much for having me on, Dr. Ken. I, no, I, I, can, tell you, I can't think of a better book for somebody <laughs> to buy for somebody they care about who's currently just eating whatever. They don't know better. This is such a great book to wake that person up. So, uh, either go ahead and get the book or you can wait for the audible, but either way, you need to check this book out. Daniel Trevor, thank you so much for doing this with me. You guys don't forget to hit the thumbs up and hit that share button on the way out because millions of people need this book right here and they don't know it exists because you haven't shared this video yet. Daniel Trevor, thank you so much for doing this. I'll see you next time. Thank you, Dr. Ken.